chosen to do the webinar today on Azure. I think a couple of you mentioned there around um, COVID uh, and exactly a lot of organisations now might have been thinking about moving to the cloud or certainly um, Azure has kind of been there, but it's kind of always been something we'll do next. And, and there's always been a little bit of concern around the risk of going to the cloud and, and how do we do it? And actually we've got all business as usual and certainly in some of the local authorities, you know, having to still manage a whole array of legacy systems on premise and to think about something like this has always been kind of uh, where do we start? Um, COVID came along and it really has accelerated a lot of people's strategies, um, hence why we wanted to share with you um, some information around the overview um, around Microsoft Azure um, and all the benefits to it, but then to also talk you through a, a recent story and case study that, that happened at before COVID, um, during COVID and, and post COVID and where that organisation is now. So we've got split the session into, into two. So we, we're going to kick off um, with um, Kishore, who is CTO for um, London um, for local government and housing at Microsoft. Um, and He's really going to focus on the benefits and really the innovations of a, of a cloud first strategy, which it sounds like everybody on, on the um, on the webinar today has started thinking that way. So it'd be really good um, to get a bit of a conversation around some of the information that I'm sure Kishore is going to share with you um, around then kind of what's happening in your own organisations. So I'll hand over to you, Kishore, if you want to take control of the um, of the of the slides. Um, and talk us through the, the benefits of, of a cloud strategy. You're just on mute at the moment. Absolutely. Thank you, Kira. <laughs> Let me, uh, I will share my screen. Perfect. So, um, as Kira mentioned, my name is Kishore. Uh, I work um, supporting customers within London and housing associations. Just a little bit about myself. I've been in Microsoft for exactly eight years and one day today. Um, I started within the services business, uh, looking after customers and supporting them in Geo, working with the likes of Ministry of Defence, Atomic Weapons, uh, various financial institutions, uh, and then gradually, various uh, through various roles, I, I've uh, landed in public sector, which is where I am today. Um, so what I wanted to do is give you a brief overview of Azure to begin with, because I, I know customers are in various stages for attendees in this call, their transformation to the cloud. So I just wanted to, to provide a, a brief overview of, of how we see Azure internally, uh, how we uh, rank with, with some of our competitors, and then go into the, the actual agenda for the presentation. So, you may have all uh, heard about Office 365, Microsoft 365, uh, Dynamics 365, and Power Platform. Uh, these are our key cloud uh, clouds that we offer, software as a service clouds. And Azure is really the enabler for all these technologies. All of the, the Office 365 solutions, Microsoft 365 solutions, Dynamics, everything is hosted out of Azure platform. So Azure is our key underlying platform that powers everything cloud within Microsoft. And uh, in terms of customers, we have uh, quite a lot of customers using Azure. Um, and that's some examples uh, that you can see on the screen, some major uh, global organizations. But how do we compare with some of our competitors? So this is uh, data for at the end of 2019. Uh, and if we take a look at uh, how many customers, enterprise customers are using Azure, uh, we're seeing the biggest growth in the marketplace. Uh, and, and those of you who were early adopters in the cloud, you will know Amazon had a head start. Uh, before Microsoft really started to invest in a cloud-first strategy, and they started to capture a lot of market share. However, if we take a look at the innovations that we're releasing from Microsoft, far greater than any other cloud platform provider out there in the market. And as a result, customers are starting more and more to choose Azure purely because of due to those innovations, due to the performance improvements that you can get, which I'll talk about in more details. And it's the most cost effective way to host uh, solutions in the cloud, which I'll also talk about in a minute. Uh, but this slide, I just want to quickly uh, show the slide because it just demonstrates the trust our customers are placing on our cloud platform and also our commitment to make sure that we carry on being leaders and innovators uh, to make sure that we're the best in the market and we keep growing um, uh, over and above our competitors in the market. 
And if we take a look at uh, Gartner, we we are featured in uh, a lot more um, uh, Magic Quadrants as the leaders compared to our competitors as well. So hopefully that will um, uh, also show the credibility of our cloud offerings as well. So enough of the, the background, let's go into the actual topic uh, with the duo. So these are the four key things that I'm going to, to focus on um, during my presentation for the next 15, 20 minutes. Um, so let's let's look at the B future ready. What does that mean? Well, customers who want to, who would like to move to the cloud, whether that's the hybrid move, whether that's a fully on cloud, whether that's the hybrid cloud strategy, or whether it's the private cloud strategy, whatever strategy that we would like to aim for, typically we got to focus on uh, these three items. First of all, how do we want to move to the cloud? Now, I asked is a lift and shift. So we take the environment that we have, whether that's physical, hyper V environment or virtualized VMware environment, and we just lift those infrastructure, so the virtual networks, the servers, the storage, uh, and then we move it into Azure. So we still have servers, we still have applications hosted in service, the exact same method of hosting our services, but it's just now hosted in a cloud data center rather than your own data center or a colo, for example, or a private uh, VPC. Serverless computing, uh, also known as uh, platform as a service uh, or Azure functions, uh, where we can uh, enable uh, solutions without a server, such as logic apps and so on, allows customers to uh, modernize even more. Uh, so by decommissioning the service, number one, we save on cost. We also save on performance. Uh, we ensure that manageability is simplified because there is nothing to manage apart from the code and then the security for the application. Uh, and it's, it offers uh, enhanced integration through API connectivity and IoT connectivity, which we'll come on to later. And co uh, low code, uh, we have our power platform uh, solutions, which offers customers to build applications, BAU applications with zero development knowledge. Uh, and most of it can be done using drag and drop, uh, which we'll also focus on a bit more in detail. So if I just... Um, quickly focus on the, the platform, Azure platform, before going into the details. We have one of the largest presence uh, of, of data centers worldwide. We have over 60 Azure regions and, and we class Azure region, uh, we use the word region, not the word data center, because one region may have multiple data center buildings that are all interlinked and connected to each other. Uh, so we use the word region, but in reality, we have hundreds of data centers worldwide. 60 regions and in the UK we have UK South which is in London and UK West which is in Newport uh, in Wales and we also have access to all the other uh, global data centers within Europe, Africa, uh, America and Asia that we can also utilize as well. We also have the largest uh, connectivity of any cloud provider. We have over 130,000 miles of, um, of fiber cabling uh, that connects our, our regions together, which means it doesn't matter where we host our services, we can go from anywhere in the world to any other part of the world using the Microsoft backbone without the internet. And we'll also talk about how you can utilize this backbone for your enterprise networking, uh, such as client VPNs, your SD-WAN solution, uh, and simplify MPLS networking to enable you to achieve a better than internet experience as a result of our backbone that we've built globally. And also we have a lot of edge sites, so these are CDN and POP locations. So should we want to have a global service uh, that users from across the world access, we can ensure a, a very highly scalable CDN solution uh, to, to enable caching locally to that user, uh, which also improves performance and latency for application and data delivery. So extensive, network, one of the largest uh, we have globally of any cloud provider. So what can we actually do with the Azure regions and the scale of deployments that we have? Well, uh, these are the three key categories that we split Azure into. Number one, infrastructure. So these are traditional infrastructure uh, that we are used to today. So computers, our CPU and RAM, so virtual machines, network storage, self-explanatory is what we're used to today. Serverless, these are platform as a service solutions, which means as customers, there is no need for you to manage the operating system. There's no need for you to manage uh, the actual physical uh, or the virtual hardware and, and uh, the uh, maintenance tasks that goes with it, such as logging, uh, security management, monitoring. None of that is needed because there is no server to manage. And all customers would need to do is ensure that the applications and the data are up to date 
and they're managed effectively and they're delivered in a secure manner to end users. So that simplifies the delivery of our services as well as manageability of our services, which means we can save a lot of administrative time that we carry out today in traditional infrastructure maintenance tasks to then use that time for other scenarios such as user adoption uh, or helping enhance some of our applications and data services. And then finally, we have edge devices. So this is becoming prevalent in a more digital world where we have more and more connected devices that are being connected via a centralized hub, such as Azure IoT. Uh, and we'll talk about that in more detail of how we can use uh, uh, hollow, uh, virtual reality uh, and also IoT to bring together rich experiences. And also we support uh, uh, a lot of uh, tools for developers, whether that's first party or third party tools and frameworks. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about this slide in, in, in a large extent, but I wanted to highlight two items. Number one, uh, the support of Linux. So Microsoft is a big Linux supporter. And in fact, we have approximately 50% uh, of all virtual machines that runs on Azure uh, is, is a Linux virtual machine. So uh, it, just because some customers believe if you have Linux, you can't host that in Azure, definitely not true. We have many, many customers hosting Linux VMs in Azure, and it's actually more cost effective uh, and we'll come on to cost later on. And we also support a variety of, uh, of partner solutions. Uh, so VMware was was one of the recent announcements we've made. You can effectively take your EXI uh, um, uh, solutions, put them directly into Azure, and have your VMware environments running in Azure. So there's quite a lot of uh, collaborations that we have with third-party vendors to enable their solutions to work natively within Azure. In terms of capabilities, I mentioned earlier when we were going through the Gartner graphs that we uh, constantly innovate. Uh, we constantly release thousands of updates uh, on, on a uh, quarterly basis to Azure. This is one of the most updated platform there is in the market right now. Uh, and, and recently we had a lot of updates uh, last month during build and every quarter we release uh, humongous uh, resources that that, that we, we uh, improve our platform by. And we also have lots of learning resources to support customers as well, to keep up to date with all the new innovations that we, we bring to the market. And I'll come on to and share some of the learning materials towards the end of my presentation. And, and finally, choice and flexibility. We want to ensure that we provide a choice to customers to ensure that you do use the applications, the frameworks, uh, third party frameworks and the solutions from other vendors as well and we're very open to to open source and third party uh, and we have again hundreds of thousands of solutions in the marketplace which are third party solutions chances are if you use a solution today on premises there is probably an equivalent solution in azure whether as a infrastructure as a service deployment or a software as a service deployment so let's let's talk about costs. Um, one of the the, the statements which uh, many customers tell me uh, when I speak to them is cloud is expensive. We don't want to move to the cloud. Um, I say no, it's not expensive, uh, and and majority of the times it's not. Um, and and we carry out assessments all the time, cloud economics assessments. Our partners such as Crimson they also help customers uh, carry out these cloud economics assessments to identify how much it costs for them to host services in the cloud compared to what it costs to host services on-prem. And majority of the times, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention why I say majority of the times and not all the times in the next slide, the majority of the times we find going to the cloud is anywhere from 25 to 40% cost effective compared to hosting services on-prem. And especially within local governments in London, uh, we've had around six or seven customers that have embarked on fully migrating their data centers to the cloud in the last 12 months. Uh, and we've saved an average around 600 to 700,000 pounds per year for those councils as a result of uh, moving their entire uh, services from their data center to the cloud. So significant cost savings to be had. Um, and the reason that uh, the, the misconceptions in the market exist that cloud is expensive is we typically don't take into account the non-IT costs. So what we typically do is we, we look at the costs in, in Azure or AWS or in Google, and then we compare that with the hardware costs that we have in our data center. So this is our server racks, network switches, cabling, stand storage, all those hardwares that we invest, uh, capital investments. And we typically only compare the cost there. We, we hardly, most of the times, compare 
uh, or look at the operational cost for running a data center. Some customers may be in a colo, some customers uh, may have a VPC managed by their managed partner. So those facility costs may not be as high as this, but for the majority of councils that we work with and housing associations where they manage their own data center, the cost is around 25%. Uh, of their uh, of their data center cost goes into facilities. We don't typically look at hardware labor costs. We need hardware engineers, whether that's outsourced or insourced, to go and repair any equipment that fails to install equipment or decommission equipment. That's something we do not um, uh, take into account. And power costs. Uh, most of the time uh, in IT, we don't actually know what the kilowatt per hour cost is for energy and we typically don't look at the power cost uh, and we need to take a holistic view of how much does it cost to run our data center which includes uh, these four key components as well as other items but these four key components uh, mainly now going to the cloud there is enough facility for a customer to manage so that goes down almost to zero percent there is no need for hardware engineers to manage the equipment in the data center we still need some hardware uh, engineers to manage the client devices uh, and, and local hot switches and so on from a networking perspective. From a data center perspective, there's no need for uh, labor costs there and power costs. Again, there's no data center to power anymore. So that cost decreases or disappears in some instances. So really the savings can be quite high. Uh, and this, these savings are achieved if we do a full migration to the cloud. There are two different, three different ways that customers uh, typically migrate to the cloud. One, is so let's do a full lift and shift, uh, which allows customers to realize these savings within a six to eight month period on average uh, for a customer that has 500 VMs, as an example. The second scenario that we see customers um, em embark on is going into a past first model, which is a serverless model rather than doing a lift and shift. Now, the payback time and the return on investment is quite large in that scenario because Typically, applications need to be modernized and, and ensure that it is uh, built in a manner that works in the past scenario. In that scenario, yes, it will be expensive initially for the initial investment to move to the cloud. But longer term, uh, the return on investment, the payback will typically occur uh, within a three to four year period compared to the first model shift where payback is typically occurred within a 12 to 18 month time frame. And the third model is having a private uh, hosted Azure environment, which is called the Azure Stack. We'll come on to that in a minute. And there are some other things to keep in mind as well with moving to the cloud. Uh, we announced as of 1st of January this year that any Windows and SQL Server 2008 and 8R2s, uh, there is no need for customers to pay for extended support. Uh, if you do move those uh, servers into Azure, we provide a, a three-year extended support complementary uh, without any cost, providing they are hosted in Azure. So that's significant savings for any customers who are unable to get off their legacy 2008 and R2 estates. We also offer um, uh, reserve instances, which is not on the slide, which means you can prepay uh, for your resources up to a maximum of three years, not just for your compute resources, but also for storage as well, which reduces costs by around 30 to 40 percent on average for most customers. And on top of that, everyone on the call are enterprise customers with Microsoft. Uh, you actually get something called Azure Hybrid Benefit, which means there is no need for you to pay Windows and SQL Server licenses for virtual machines deployed in Azure, which further brings down the cost of services that we deploy in Azure. So there's a vast array of things that we need to take in mind when we carry out the cloud economics assessments. Uh, and when we take into account all these various offers and discounts and pricings that we have, uh, the cloud really becomes cost effective compared to having uh, resources on prem. And finally, related to cost, uh, we also announced APAs, your pricing and their arrangement for government customers, uh, which will further uh, provide discounts on top of the pay should go as your pricing uh, for any customers that are on an enterprise agreement uh, subscription, which we're very happy to follow up uh, if you would like to know more about the, the government uh, negotiated discounts. So uh, let's now talk about, stop talking about pricing. Let's look at some of the innovations. So in the infrastructure world, let's look at three key items that a majority of customers are starting to use. First of all is Azure Synapse. Synapse used to be called um, uh, uh, SQL Data Warehouse in the past. We rebranded that to bring data warehousing uh, and big data analytics into a single powerful tool called Azure Synapse. Uh, Synapse allows uh, limitless scale uh, you can effectively bring data 
uh, across all your data warehouses, not just Azure, uh, big data systems. And we ensure that uh, we deliver insights at an amazingly fast speed, typically 12 times the performance uh, of uh, a nearest competitor in the marketplace. We also offer powerful insights through integration with Azure Machine Learning and Power BI to create various data models, uh, which is made enabled as a result of Synapse. And also we provide uh, very good security as a result of Azure AD and the components that go with Azure AD, as well as built-in security and integration to Synapse to provide customers the peace of mind that your data is safe in the Azure cloud uh, and, and it will not be compromised or used for any marketing or sales benefit to Microsoft. It's private data only for used by our customers. The second key thing that uh, key solution that we are seeing used uh, quite a lot by customers is called Azure WAN. Now Azure WAN is a, a very clever technology. It's a software defined WAN solution that can be hosted in Azure. Um, and the way that Azure WAN works is uh, will enable customers to minimize the MPLS footprints to a bare minimum, or in some cases, even decommission MPLS completely. Uh, and MPLS is not cheap, uh, especially if you have multiple sites, multiple hundred sites, for example. It will cost multiple millions over a period of time. Azure WAN can take the costs of your existing MPLS and any other WAN networking uh, costs that you have today, and it will divide that by 30. So whatever the cost is, let's say we, we spend a million pounds a year, let's divide that by 30, and that will be the new networking costs when it comes to WANs and, and MPLS solutions and uh, large companies such as coca-cola uh, airline booking systems uh, and also some of the european government organizations are now using azure WAN, and we will have one uh, two uh, customers within the local authority space in london that will have azure WAN deployed in production by the end of august so we will it's not just a global service we will have local council customers that will have this in production and connected to psn and various other uh, services by the end of August. And not only does it save on cost, it improves on performance. A lot of customers in, in, in the COVID lockdown initially uh, in March and April had uh, many issues with VPN and direct access. Many customers are now using split tunneling and are looking for a move to always on VPN. Well, we say decommission your VPN service. There is no need for you to have a direct access server or a Citrix and Connect server or an always on VPN server. Let's shut them down. We can connect our client machines directly to Azure WAN, which offers anywhere from 10 gigabits per second to 20 gigabits per second throughput, far greater than any bandwidth that, that clients will have today. So Azure WAN is a truly transformational project and we're seeing more and more customers use that. And um, I think we've got uh, probably half of the local authorities in London that are currently piloting this scenario. So this is something if you're not already looking at i would strongly recommend you do focus because it is going to bring a lot of benefits to organizations of any size and then finally windows virtual desktop uh, this is again which customers have used as a tactical solution for covid but now that covid is starting to ease a little bit the lockdown is starting to ease slightly in certain areas uh, customers are now looking at virtual desktop solutions in azure as a strategic approach rather than just a contingency solution uh, a temporary solution where we have customers coming to us and asking guidance on how they can move from Citrix into WVD, how they can move from RDS into the BVD to ensure that they save on costs, to ensure that they improve performance. And we've also uh, added lots of under the hood performance for Teams as well. So we can have effective Teams meetings from a virtualized desktop um, in, in the cloud. Uh, so virtualized desktop is again something we are uh, seeing a huge adoption in, in the past uh, few months. Um, IoT, let's talk about some innovation now. IoT, uh, one of the things I hear again from our customers quite a lot is we're not ready for IoT. Well, my response is you may be surprised. Um, a lot of customers feel that because they don't have the data warehousing capabilities today, uh, they don't have the various infrastructure in place today, IoT is a, a far reach for them to achieve. Um, I, I actually think differently. Um, uh, Azure offers a IoT hub, and IoT hub includes a lot of different solutions uh, that allows us to connect devices uh, and uh, uh, manipulate the data and to have meaningful insights and simulations and modeling with that data. Uh, and this is just some examples of different services that you can use. And I'm going to talk about digital twins in more detail 
in a second. But we have various solutions in the marketplace, data warehousing solutions, device vendors that can be simply deployed in a single click. So there's no need for you to go and deploy a data warehousing solution, spend a year, year and a half getting that ready before embarking on an IoT strategy. We can do that in, in a week. Uh, and ensure that IoT data can be put into those solutions. And then we can have a strategy to ensure we take our existing enterprise data and integrate and merge uh, with the IoT um, uh, solutions that we have deployed. So there's very many things that we can do out of the box packages, both from a hardware and from a solution perspective. So IoT is definitely not out of the reach. Doesn't matter where you are in the cloud journey. Doesn't matter where you are in the modernization journey. Azure is uh, definitely an enabler. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of customers using digital twins. So in the housing space, we have one housing associations, uh, one housing association, uh, which is headquartered in, in London. I can't name them just yet, uh, but we're building a, a proof of concept using digital twins. And what digital twins is, it takes a digital representation of a physical asset. And in this scenario, a building is a physical asset. And it digitalizes that with an IoT. Now, this provides customers three benefits. Number one, it provides a single view of your assets in a 3D environment. No more having to manage assets using spreadsheets, which I know some housing associations are doing. That's just enables you to drastically modify asset management. Um, secondly, we'll have real-time asset performance through various sensors that we will retrofit into existing buildings, or we can build into the new uh, buildings that we are constructing today. And that will give you real-time asset performance to carry out predictive maintenance and also fire safety. So we actually have, uh, we're working on a, a connection, a relationship with the London Fire Brigade and this housing association that we're piloting with. So in the event of a fire in a high rise building, there is no need for anyone to call 999. There is no need for anyone to report this to the fire. The command center in the London Fire Brigade will know what's happening. They'll have a 3D version of the building on their systems through effective data sharing, uh, and they will be able to direct responses effectively. And we'll also know where people are trapped in a certain part of the building through motion detection sensors, and we can reach the vulnerable people a lot quickly. Social trends is something which I would recommend strongly if you haven't already taken a look at to, to invest, because it will not only save on costs, so this housing solution is going to save 15 million pounds uh, in a single year through their maintenance expenditures, as a result of using digital twins, but it also provides safety and enhanced uh, asset performance management. And we have thousands of customers using Azure IT, and we'll, we'll share all these uh, video recordings later so you can take a look at the customers in more detail. And we also have thousands of certified Azure devices and partners uh, that can enable uh, and provide the hardware and the connectivity required to bring those data into Azure and then use that data in a meaningful manner. And some momentum of uh, how Azure uh, IoT and AI is growing uh, in within our customers in the enterprise space. So um, I have a, just a couple more slides and I'm overrunning a little bit, so I'll, I'll go very quickly. So build on your terms. What does build on your term means? It means we don't want to restrict customers on what you can do within our platform, within the Azure platform. We want to give you all the tools and resources to allow customers to decide how you want or you would like to build and how you would like to get, go into Azure and host your services. So first of all, we do not sell your data uh, like some of the other organizations openly share. Your data is your data. We don't actually have access to your data. Uh, so that's the number one thing. Number two, we provide all the capabilities needed to host a very highly scalable and very highly um, scalable and, and DR protected scenarios from a high availability. So should something go wrong in a specific region in Azure, we can enable an instant switch to another Azure region to provide an always on connected scenario to your uh, to your customers, whether that's internal staff or external consumers. Um, and there's actually no need to go for a dual cloud strategy anymore because we have various data centers of various regions, various ways of bundling in services um, which effectively negates the need to have dual cloud vendor strategy because you have a dual cloud strategy within a single vendor. So there's a lot of things we can do, but we provide the flexibility for customers to decide what that move and scale and, and HA should be. And from a, an innovation perspective, we're focusing a lot on the top item here, which is scale innovation, especially on low code, uh, no code solutions. And that's where things like Power Apps and Microsoft Flow comes in. 
it allows customers to, to effectively decommission legacy solutions that you may have procured a long time ago off the sales solutions or custom developed applications. Um, prevent, stop paying a lot of money for it, and we can develop in house very simple no code solutions uh, in, in Power Apps powered by Azure in the background and Microsoft Flow to ensure that we can still carry on the BAU, offering BAU services and applications to our end users, but without having to pay a lot of money for support. Uh, for application maintenance, modernizations, and we can actually bring all this in-house in a very easy to develop and manageable scenario. Um, operate hybrid seamlessly. Now, um, I would like to start off with this slide. Uh, a few years back, uh, so I've been working in Azure for around seven to seven and a half years now, uh, and around four or five years ago, hybrid was the strategy that a lot of customers chose. And because uh, eight, seven, eight years ago, Azure was quite a new thing. Uh, cloud was quite a new concept. Customers didn't actually trust the cloud. They wanted to see how the cloud evolved. And, and to be honest, back then, security was not as good as we have today. We have a very highly secure uh, platform. And, and customers wanted to go into a hybrid environment because if something did happen to the cloud, it's a very easy failover back to on-prem. But today, uh, hybrid is no longer the strategy that many customers prefer. Prefer Fully on cloud is the strategy that many senior decision makers are preferring. And if I focus on, on housing associations that I'm looking after and supporting, and the local government organizations that I'm supporting in London, this is definitely a strategy uh, that they are focusing on. And I mentioned earlier, six local authorities uh, are now going fully into Azure. They're not going into a hybrid environment because they know that's expensive and that's no longer required in, in the current state of technologies that we have available. So fully cloud is what customers are now moving into as a strategy. However, um, we do not want to block out customers who do want to invest in a hybrid model. And there could be various reasons, legal reasons, legislation reasons. So we, we still offer the, the best hybrid capability of any cloud provider. Any Microsoft solutions you have running on-prem, there is an equivalent service in Azure, which can work in a hybrid model. And we can manage that using Azure Arc. Azure Arc is a fantastic tool. Not many customers would have heard about it, but Azure Arc, Arc would allow you to manage your um, multi-cloud, so AWS and, and um, uh, Azure, if you decide to go a multi-cloud strategy. It will allow you to manage your on-prem resources from Azure, uh, providing you the same uh, manageability for on-prem. It will also allow you to manage your edge devices, such as your IoT and gateways through Azure Arc. This is a single management pane no matter where your infrastructure or, or data and applications and services are placed. Extremely powerful tool. Uh, it's been in the market for around a year, year and a half, uh, but not many customers are aware of this. And this is something that I would highly recommend that if you're not already aware of this, to do uh, look into this and, and both Crimson and Microsoft will be very happy to follow up in more detail, to look at Azure Arc and how we can streamline operations and save costs uh, and also help uh, accelerate the journey to the cloud as well. And finally, trust uh, is my last uh, uh, item that I'll focus on. We want customers to trust Microsoft. We want customers to trust a customer. We want customers to trust to put their data within our cloud and put their applications and infrastructure within our cloud. And we do that in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, we offer a global footprint, which means that we offer a, a very near real time failover scenario should something go wrong in the region. So from a DR and HA perspective, we offer lots and lots of solutions across each of our 60 regions worldwide that customers can utilize. Uh, we have a large investment in our cyber defense operations. We have over a billion, I believe it's 1.2 billion to be exact dollars per year that we invest in our global security operations center. And their job is to ensure that any attacks uh, that come uh, towards any Microsoft services are prevented and blocked uh, and prevented from, from happening in the future. Not just Microsoft services, but also your services and your network that is hosted in Microsoft. To give you an example, the Microsoft website, uh, we get attempts to hack our Microsoft.com website, millions of, of attempts every month. To date, no one has been being, no one has been able to hack our main Microsoft.com website. Uh, and this is the job of our Cyber Defense Security Operations Center. Their job is to ensure that they detect these real time and they uh, eradicate those security issues real time. And compliance as well, we have one of the largest compliance offerings worldwide, whether that's regional compliance within the UK or if you're looking for global standards uh, compliance, we have quite a lot and we will be happy to share 
the URL for you to read into how we achieve and maintain those compliance offerings. Secondly, in order to build trust with our customers, we need to ensure that we provide the resources to help customers learn and, and enhance the skills from an IT perspective. So we offer hundreds of free uh, courses using the Microsoft Learn. We also have something called Enterprise Skills Initiative, where customers can train for free uh, or for Azure exams. And we also offer free Azure vouchers for you to go and carry out the Azure exams for free. And recently, uh, Satya Nadella uh, and also Brad Smith uh, recently announced uh, two days ago uh, a very large skills initiative that Microsoft has launched globally to help people skill uh, as, as part of a return to COVID strategy and get into technology and various other professions. So we are investing lots and lots of resources and money to help customers gain skills, uh, which again goes into the trust. We want you to be successful. And the only way we can help customers to be successful is by helping provide the knowledge and education. Cloud option framework, I won't talk about this too much, but it's just to help you uh, manage your cloud services and plan the move to the cloud effectively and also help uh, ensure you do not overspend and we have a very secure manner. Uh, and by helping customers achieve this via our partners and through Microsoft resources, uh, we help build trust with customers by ensuring you do not overspend. Uh, we provide the, the best pricing possible and also we provide the best guidance and advice from a governance and operations perspective, whether that's a managed service for the partner or, or a do-it-yourself type scenario in-house. And uptime, uh, this is a 12 month average that we, we got uh, for the 12 months up to September 2019. 99.998% uh, uh, was the overall aggregated uptime of all services in Azure combined. And the way we define SLA is depending on the type of services uh, and the type of importance that have uh, for customers. So any non-sensitive services, 99% is the lowest SLA that we offer from an availability. And for mission critical services, we have 99.39, which is the highest SLA that we offer. Uh, so depending on the services, the SLA will be different, but this is how we classify availability based on uh, the criticality of services in Azure. Uh, and also ensuring that we help you build resilient services. We're already talking about the foundation, which is the Azure platform. Resiliency, we've talked about VR and, and the failover scenarios, and any application you build in Azure will automatically have access to our resiliency foundation and services that we have embedded in Azure. And, and finally, uh, last slide is uh, how do we stay informed of updates? Uh, we have a comprehensive Azure updates page and we'll, we'll make sure we share all these links later. Uh, and also we have uh, all the available products by the region that uh, customers can browse and take a look at what's available uh, within the UK regions or Europe regions or different parts of the world. So with that, um, I will wrap up uh, my session. So hopefully that has given you an idea in terms of costs, in terms of some of the innovations we can achieve uh, and why Azure um, is the best platform for enterprise customers. Um, so I'll pass over to Kira and we'd <laughs> love to take any questions if you have any time. Yeah, I don't know whether anybody um, has, has got any questions. I think, thanks Kishore, that was certainly um, quite mind blowing actually going through all of that I thought I knew I thought I knew quite a lot about Azure clearly not um I don't know how other people had thought but I think um yeah has anybody got anything that they they sort of burning questions that they that they'd like to ask directly to to Kishore it's always that silence I'm just having a little look okay um, so we will we'll move on um, to the next part. I guess just summarising on a couple of points there. Um, certainly from um, sort of local authorities um, and, and housing associations. Uh, you know, I think the slides there around cost um, and around um, risk around data are certainly conversations that I have with a lot of customers. Um, in my in my other life, I'm also a board director of a housing association and we during COVID have had numerous conversations um, around the cloud. Um, you mentioned Kishore Citrix, which was kind of um, everybody's saying we, we, we need to get rid of Citrix, we need to do things differently. But also, um, really importantly, and only yesterday, we were talking more around kind of IoT in the homes um, and how that's going to really help our customers going forward now, given that there are going to be lots of um, lots of 
issues and concerns within the homes now. People are going to be in the homes more. People are going to be affected by fuel poverty in some of the um, older types of properties. In terms of how we deliver maintenance and actually being able to get into properties, it has been really, really um, topical. And things like um, the Azure IoT Hub really kind of open discussions to look at how we can do services differently. But to do that, we've almost got to put the infrastructures in place and similar conversation with local authorities. Um, but I always use the really um, basic analogy about we build lots of houses and whenever we look at developments, we always look at the infrastructure that we put in place. And actually now I think public sector is really looking at its infrastructure, um, i.e. its technology and its platform to allow it to be able to really move forward, not just because of COVID and some of the issues we've had, but also moving forward um, in terms of service improvement, better customer engagement, and also some of the expectations. So um, re really thanks, Kishore. Um, I guess we'll move over now to, um, to Steve Banner, who is our lead, um, practice lead for Azure at Crimson. Um, and and Steve's, Steve and his team um, have worked um, over the last year, I would say, um, on a particular project uh, with the London Council, um, which was a, a migration. Uh, and Steve's going to talk to you about the journey and really highlight some of the real issues, some of the real things that happen on this kind of journey um, and, and how you can mitigate that risk and how that can work and what success can look like. So I'm going to hand over to Steve. I'll let you do a quick introduction, Steve, about yourself um, and then please take us through a, a migration journey. Thank you. Uh, just check you guys can see my screen OK. Yeah, Brilliant. Again, if there's any questions, guys, just either ask or ask in the chat window and same yeah. thing we'll ask as we go in. Please do, because I mean, we've got around 20 minutes and, and what this is intended to be is, um, as, as Kira said, we've successfully completed a, a recent migration project. I know from the introductions that you guys, some of you perhaps are at the beginning of a project or considering a project. Really, the theme is, of this is how do you de risk or how do you gain confidence in an Azure migration project? Uh, please excuse the simplicity of my slides. They're there as a name of my memoir for me. But what we'll do is we'll, we'll go through the journey of this specific project. Uh, Partway through, we had an unexpected impact of COVID as well, so we'll cover that off. But hopefully give you confidence in, in the tooling, the methods that we used to deliver the success. So what was the project? Uh, project was an exit data centre. There was a specific point in time if the services were still in the data centre, then there was a, a high financial penalty. So you had a point in time where services need to be removed from the data centre and the decision was taken to migrate them to Azure for all the benefits it gave. Toward the beginning of the journey, um, the idea was that the workloads that were hosted in the data center would be uh, re-architected perhaps to PaaS platform as a service or software as a service. Um, so Crimson were engaged at that point to assess the validity, the cost of migrating these services. Um, one of Crimson's strengths as well, obviously I head up the Azure practice, but we also have a, a very large dynamics practice and a modern workplace practice as well. And some of the workloads that are in scope of migration were dynamics and SharePoint. So across our three teams, we analyzed the, the um, efficiency really of migrating these workloads. For Dynamics, it was assessed that yes, we could migrate Dynamics from the data center to SAS, Office 365 Dynamics, uh, within the time frame needed. So that was that decision made. For the SharePoint that was there, uh, we could migrate to PaaS, but it was quite a sizable project and it didn't fit within the time scale. So a rehost. Um, model was decided upon where we lifted and shifted the SharePoint services into the Azure cloud. Um, that process from the Azure side really was as well. We had uh, three environments to migrate within the data center. Uh, we had several different workload types, um, around 150 servers to, to migrate or services from those servers. How do we gain confidence that we can hit the timeline because it was looming, uh, what the cost will be, and obviously that it will work successfully with minimal snags. So we used the Azure Migrate service to analyze the, the footprint of workloads to confirm that they were compatible to Azure, to obviously work out what the cost would be, as Kishore um, 
highlighted earlier really the cost benefit was was at the end of that um, assessment was seen to be very favorable by migrating to Azure. Uh, so we got to a point really where the assessment part was complete and we had two distinct paths. For dynamics, we were moving um, to SAS. For everything else, we were doing a rehost to Azure. How do we continue to de-risk? So the next part of the journey was that our, our particular organization that we were working with had a very light Azure footprint. They dabbled before and had a few light services in Azure, but didn't have a strong presence there. So confidence was needed that these quite sizable workloads that were being migrated to a, a somewhat untested platform would work. How did we get around that? Um, we used our, our Crimson Azure Pathfinder, I suppose our branding, of, again, as Kishore showed there, um, your cloud migration strategy to take the customer through confidence, really, that governance was in place or would be put in place. There were controls around security, tight controls around security, and also around cost as well. It's one of the fears, I think, that we see on the ground with customers perhaps sized the project and there's confidence in that but governance for people using this in a slightly different sectors but certainly in the university areas etc cost um, control is a concern so throughout this this journey we started with the customer um, by really growing their confidence by some iterative workshops building their Azure core technology uh, and governance etc the next thing for this particular project, once that was done, we had a core then, was how long will it take to migrate the services? We've got a go live cutover to consider here, how long during the cutover weekend. We had actually, we, we had a, uh, a weekend where we could take the services down and then bring them back up, but it was a relatively tight time in with that weekend. We had a lot of third parties interacting with the services as well. So we needed confidence that the migration could be done in a timely fashion. Um, that it would be compatible when moved to Azure and obviously would there be any snagging needed with the rehosting model uh, and also uh, considering go live can we migrate these services um, within a timely fashion how did we de-risk that plan and test um, and basics really of any IT project but the beauty of Azure was that we were able to do test failovers and I've got a second slide to go more into the technical services we used but we were able to test fell over the whole data center services that we were going to take for robust uh, user acceptance testing uh, for security boundary testing uh, we were also during that time able to assess the failover times well, we had terabytes of data so how do we move data around the data center itself had somewhat limited bandwidth at the time so all of those factors we were able to gain high confidence in by doing test failovers um, that the actual live failover and the service that would be failed over would be robust Another part of this was that the operational team for the organization was going to take some support of Azure. Um, obviously, Crimson, we've got a full support offering as well, flying that flag. So there were elements of Azure uh, that the Crimson team would take support on and elements of Azure that the operational team uh, local would. One of the great benefits, one of our ways of working is to really get as close as we can with the operational teams as soon as we can. So from project delivery through to as soon as possible to working with the operational teams to explain the design that we had, the agreed design. Um, one of the things actually that we changed is we were going to use Azure front door uh, as a security perimeter, but due to the operational team managing that moving forward would be the local, they decided to use a network virtual appliance or a, a, a virtualized firewall service because it was a service they already utilized within their network so they were happier that that would provide the requirement and also the onboarding for that service would be quicker as well but yeah definitely i think a way of de-risking was throughout the year of the project working closely with the operational teams as we got part way through the project so that they could see the real world issues that we faced day to day um, and their confidence grew in maintaining that structure as it went forward into production Challenges, um, one challenge that we had is we had limited bandwidth at the data center to push data out. We were able to up that bandwidth, but it made us, um, one of the 
working with Azure for years, I suppose you get used to being able to move large chunks of data around very quickly. But the reality, obviously, when you're working off Azure is that there are constraints. So we were able to make efficiencies to ensure that the cutover of that data was, uh, was timely. Um, the initial synchronization of data took some time. But again, by utilizing the tools, we were able to, to know what that time scale was and build it into our project plan. Uh, a small point as well, obviously there was many third parties involved with the support of the services that were in scope for migration and also the data centre as well. The relationship where was that the, there was an exit strategy for the data centre, so we had to rely on um, third parties for installing the Azure Migrate tool, for example. Very small footprint, but needs installing in network. Um, and it, from what would have been a couple of days installation, there was a couple of months delay there. So how did we de-risk that? I suppose as any project, uh, we offered eyes on, kind of eyes over the shoulder, um, assistance for getting that tool installed and functioning. So how did we migrate? What, what tools did we actually use? We used Azure Migrate to do the assessment part and to gain confidence in compatibility and pricing. We then used the Azure Uh, my way, but it was all site recovery service. So as all site recovery uh, can be utilized as a DR strategy. Obviously, if you have workloads uh, on prem hosting a data center or in other cloud services, Azure Site Recovery offers the ability to be able to synchronize those services um, to Azure Cloud. It's a really good tool for migration as well for rehosting because what we were able to do is utilize Azure Site Recovery to basically snapshot the servers that were in situ, um, do a full um, copy of them. And then as time went on, differential copies happen um, up to every hour. You can control how often. So we had a refreshed environment sitting within Azure, ready to test failover at points, which was a great help to the project that if we needed to refresh an environment uh, for testing, then we could do. We used Azure Site Recovery. Part of the design was that with time against us, we needed to really utilized Azure services as well for networking and core services. So as the data center scope was the services only really, the periphery parts, so networking, load balances, security boundaries, uh, we utilize Azure virtual networks, Azure load balances, Azure application gateways, and as we said earlier, virtual appliances, which allowed us to quickly deploy um, you know, a secured structure within Azure. Um, also, the services as well, the services weren't being migrated, so you can appreciate there are security monitoring services, backup services within the data center that weren't in scope for migration because they resided at the data center. So again, efficiently and also because of the wealth of information from Microsoft for, for learning, we were able to utilize Azure backup um, monitoring services, obviously cost management to ensure that, that, that uh, confidence in cost control. Um, and we also, again, we use Azure Site Recovery for a second purpose, is we're not just migrating the service to Azure, but the model was that there would be a, a second region DR model, and Azure Site Recovery was used within Azure to offer that um, DR service as well. So again, Azure Technologies services, the softer ones perhaps around the periphery, were able to quickly build them to replace the data center um, lost services, and also teams upskilled as well to utilize them. Environments and servers, I think we've already covered off that we used Azure Site Recovery to move the servers over. And once we had the initial synchronization, it was great because we basically had a production copy within Azure where we could test. Um, obviously, we had the security boundaries round and that allowed for third party connectivity testing to the Azure bubble, as we called it at that time, which was separate to the, the ASIS production service um, and allowed for real stringent testing and high confidence. And those risks we talked about, obviously, uh, the ability to de-risk. What challenges did we have during during the migration stage? Data center bandwidth, I think we covered. You know, the luxury in Azure is almost unlimited. I think one of the Microsoft technicians said we we're only restricted by the speed of light when we were moving some of the data around. Um, project time scale, so somewhat of a mundane project um, issue, probably not the right word, but consideration was that the CRM SaaS service still went ahead, but due to the time scales, we had to quite quickly um, rehost the CRM service to Azure, which weren't originally in scope, um, 
benefit being with the current structure we had in place as all site recovery and the capacity, it took days really just to add that service load to the migration. COVID was unexpected. It, it, we were probably two thirds of the way through the project, if not three quarters. I remember quite vividly one of the project meetings, our weekly project meetings, I think it was probably January, mid January, early January, where we said, oh, for go live risks, we'll do, we need to add COVID risk, obviously, to go live. And within weeks, um, things change very quickly, as we're all aware. It had minimal impact to the project, really. Um, we were able to function, the, the, the project teams were displaced, obviously it was not just Crimson because we were used to a remote way of working, but our customer was more on site based uh, or the third parties as well. But I think it's fair to say we didn't miss a beat during the, uh, the, the project stage. Uh, we had a very temporary resource restriction with the, in the Missouri UK South region. Um, again, due to the unprecedented load there, an unexpected load. And what was really good is this is where we, the relationship with Microsoft customer Crimson as we were working, within days we were able to find an alternative region and utilize all the tools that we had in place. So it was an actual real world test of them. Um, we're, not, we're not live yet, but we need to migrate some of these workloads to a separate region within days we were able to do so. So it was a, it was a challenge, but one that was quickly uh, ratified really. And the nice thing is we utilize the tools that are in place um, to, to migrate those workloads within Azure to another region. So hopefully that's give you a flavor for the project, the journey, some of the challenges as well, the real world challenges and considerations. And I, any IT project planning and testing, I think, was the way that confidence really, really grew. We used the, the Crimson Azure Pathfinder to build structure into the, the Azure environment to, to guide the customer through choices they had to make on resilience, um, multi-region, et cetera. Uh, they felt like they could make informed choices because of that and had a, a, a robust implementation and a robust migration of their services as well. Thanks, Steve. Any questions? I was going to um, I was just just on that because I think thank you Steve I think it was really useful to to hear a sort of almost real life um, implementation Um, I was just going to to, to ask actually because we've got um, a couple of local authorities and obviously um, housing or housing associations just from um, I guess the the local authority side so we've got um, Matt and Chris um, both on from from local authorities from um, Cornwall and also uh, Linton Borough of Bromley. Uh, does does any of this? Um, I don't know if either or each of you are able to sort of comment on on sort of the session and does some of these things kind of uh, help you in your thinking or, or what's your thoughts kind of from that local authority perspective? Don't know who wants to start. Yeah, so so can it. Based on observations from our side, I guess at the moment we've got a challenge where we, we have a, a local data centre which we own. And I guess my um, question to Steve was, was that a hosted data centre? So you're asked to exit that? So it, that, that, yeah, go on, sorry. Yes, yeah, so um, obviously the, the customer was in a position where the, yeah, I think it was it was really a cost consideration um, and we came in slightly later so the decision had already been made that that data center was not a viable moving forward so it was where do we move the the uh, the workloads to uh, I think the customer had had chosen cloud uh, you know had done their assessment early days and then as our journey started with them it was really um, flying the flag for the Azure services and the and what we talked about, de-risking confidence. I don't know, as any project, they, they really wanted confidence that these workloads, because they were um, customer-facing workloads, which were causing them some pain, I think it's fair to say, with, with service degradation and some service outages. So they wanted confidence that they'd move to, um, you know, do a, a project and there will be success at the end of it, which would be A, the services are migrated and B, they work being frank, if, if, if there's any more downtime or if the services were, were still degraded, there wouldn't have been success. And obviously the, the selling point of Azure was right sizing the services uh, and being able to scale if needs be. Chris, on that, you, meant, is, do you is yours own data? Because there's what's hosted, is yours, you own the data yeah, centre. So, so, so we own the yeah. data centre. So it's, just, it's a slightly different scenario. Mm. We, ob we obviously see the benefits. Um, yes. And, and I, I kind of line to 
some of the challenges that Steve um, uh, explained there. Um, I think and then, yeah, go on, sorry. And that's where the hybrid model comes in because I mean, a big bang change isn't always the model that a lot of organisations take. This is quite a specific scenario, really, and I suppose shows the success of being able to use Azure tools. But as you said, uh, if you've got a local data centre and would like to migrate some workloads or start to, to test the waters of Azure cloud computing, then the hybrid model works quite well. And actually, Azure Pathfinder, but that's the journey a lot of our customers are on, is how do we extend into the cloud? How do we, it may be a lighter service that we're moving to get confidence, but how do we ensure we put all the structures around and that if we do grow, that it's, it's fit for growth, our, our cloud implementation. And, and how have the operational teams um, adjusted so, so you provided some support, there's some operational yeah. team involvement. There. So what, what kind of tooling have they used? Have they used the Azure Monitor, um, the Azure, which um, uh, Kaisho um, mentioned Arc earlier, which is probably not applicable to this case, but what, what kind of tools have you used to support yeah. that team? Yeah, so there's what we do with Crimson is workshops. I mean, there's there's a lot of Microsoft Learn um, options there for training sessions, etc. Uh, we we run workshops with operational teams. That can be a benefit, I think, to the project as a whole. Uh, and again, we try and terms with real world considerations that we've ran workloads in Azure for some time now. These are the basics that you need to cover. Azure Monitor, for example, cost management is a strong one really for, for teams. Um, utilizing those services and also some education as well on general models are you have hybrid so there'd be a virtual network there may be express route connectivity or vpn connectivity for a smaller project um, and how is the confidence that you monitor those um, using capacity management type functions as well how do you make sure that you you can size correctly and continue to um, how can you use cloud benefits dynamic size and how can you save money some real basics automation to turn servers off when they're not being utilized or ensuring that auto scaling is configured correctly um, before that an awareness of what can auto scale some services can't so there is an element of right sizing so all of that journey uh, is initially with the project team normally and then quite quick what we do find is where an operational team will be heavily involved in utilizing the, looking after the Azure services onboarding them as soon as possible and a classic in all environments I think normally the operational team are the most one of the most busy because they've got 101 things to look at and sometimes learning a new technology isn't always top of the list um, for some it is for some it's just another service they have to look after and it's it's a little bit of empathy with them to try and get those workshops so that the the not the bare minimum, but the essentials that they need to consider for the Azure service are covered, as well as learning as well. Yeah, so, so there's all those things, um, that what, what I see as benefits, especially the, the DR site recovery yeah. capability, which is, which is, is, is obviously um, quite a favorable um, advantage of moving to Azure and, and delivering that, because at the moment we, we can't. Well, we can do that on-prem, but it would, um, it's a significant cost and work to do that when Azure will provide those functionalities. I suppose my last question is, what was the feedback from the customer now? So from the housing association that then they moved over, you know, what are the benefits they're coming back and telling you, you know, about the service? I've got some on the ground ones and Kira obviously as account manager we have different different types of conversations <laughs> I suppose but what one of the real world ones is they were so constrained about services that they wanted to go into the data center that they couldn't deliver because of the the time it took to scale and the concerns about stability so they now have full control of their environment they are able to scale very quickly for new projects they're confident so obviously they're giving a service to their internal customers of, of various um, sites etc so um, their confidence is grown it's under their control to scale so they can deliver projects um, quickly. I think I think that's a, that's a really big one and I think one of the um, um, you know that this this case was a local authority but it, it, it's around cost saving um, you know and actually the ability to but you know we, we started off looking at what servers for example excuse my non-technical um, side here but to, to power off almost in the hours not needed um, we're now at the over excitement stage where they're looking at everything what can we turn off when we don't need it how can we do this this whole kind of really making the most of, of being able to 
to do that now and not run things when they don't need to but also when there is high traffic and there is things and, and we know uh, you know their website and their, their customer facing was really key to them and that had been something that had driven performance issues previously things like you know IT directors having sleepless nights worrying that the the website was going to go down they're not going to be aware of it um, certainly during COVID when that started it, it was really providing some sort of sleepless nights um, but having that kind of um, security almost that knowing that that isn't going to happen or the recovery is there very quickly um, but but certainly on saving costs it was really driven by by now being able to to do that and, and the conversations are you know what else let's look at this again every time it's evolving there's more stuff they're looking at so they're almost reaping the benefits of some of the cost savings which you know I'm sure in local authority you sort of uh, can uh, concur with there um, just just conscious of everybody's time I just wanted to to ask um, on um, red kite um, you you guys are are looking at this your your part way through your your thinking and your journey is there anything um that's that's kind of um, helped today or, or kind of sort of made you think about I don't know who wants to answer any anyone uh, Lee, do you want to give a shout because you're sure. from a more technical perspective? <laughs> That's what I always do. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, I mean, we've already, you know, utilising a lot of Office 365 and Dynamics 365, and we're looking at this from the point of our actual other IT services and servers that we have in our data centre and how in the future we can possibly move those to Azure, and it is as you covered in different points there whether some of them are going to sit best as just a sort of lift and shift of the entire sort of vm or where we can look at some of the sort of serverless concepts like um sql just running in azure and any sort of um, logic or function apps as well but um yeah it's good to know it's good to know what what's available and um, the initial presentation about some of the other sort of facilities that azure you know the features and the functions that are there some of those things are were, were sort of new to me as well so they're going to be interesting to sort of look into and see if that is things that we're going to be able to use to benefit the business in the future as well yeah I, th I think that's what made me so I, I i was like you thought thought i knew a little bit but actually the new features and i think that is one of the benefits around investing in um technology a, a technology platform like microsoft is that they're just plugging so much money into investment that we almost don't need to think about it if, if whatever you've thought of they've probably already developed it and it's there and you might not need it yet um but i certainly think on, on the iot side um we're going to see such a shift in in housing as we move forward and i mean the digital twins i i just find amazing um and i think you know definitely post grenville you know we're really seeing how that the digital twins kind of is going to to really um, make an effect and, and and iot around the maintenance of our homes um, and being able to do things a lot more remotely and we, we've seen that around gas servicing and and the fact that you know we're not able to get into homes at the moment when we're, we're not able to do some of the the real safety stuff that we want to do um and actually how can we how can we look at some of more of the technology stuff that's going to help us um going forward um but no but i thank you everybody for your time i don't know whether anyone else has got any questions i um this is catherine so i agree yeah. it, was the, it was the digital twins really that that tweaked my interest in something i'll sort of look at afterwards um i know it's I'm not coming at this question from a technical perspective, but um, when we talk about digital twins and we, when we talk about cloud migrations, one thing that we've struggled with is really engaging our, our customers. So for Redkite, we have an ethos of being tenant led. That That's what we are about. We kind of feel that the, this is the tenant's business and we're just custodians of, of, of helping them run it. And we've really struggled with that engagement um and i as i said i know it's not a technical issue but it's how do we how do we make technology accessible so that they can really be on board and understand these migrations these strategies that we're taking on so that they can influence the direction that's what i'm also kind of interested in and i don't know whether as an organization um there are kind of future webinars that might kind of help touch on that because um, I don't think people really do appreciate that the the possibilities um, 
Um, but yeah, so for what I've taken from it, there's certainly some more things I would like Red Kite to kind of explore. Pelovi leads our business change team, so um, that's where those conversations will start to come in, I'm sure. No, definitely. I mean, Keisha, you, you've probably stole the, the question Keisha was going to ask you, I think, there around <laughs> yeah, the I was, topic. I was, just about, I was about to say that then, so I'm, I'm glad you um, you said that. So this is a part of a series, so we will be doing monthly webinars, so it's great that you put, you've got your input there. And what we will do is send out a feedback form just around to, well, how you found today, but also around topics and really what's your pressing challenges and what you'd like to learn about, because it's important that it's of interest to you, but also that we can value. you. So that's really useful. I've got, I've made a note of that um, yeah. as well. I'll pick, I'll pick up with you on that, um, Catherine, because actually I'm quite interested in, in that thought there around um, from the from the customer side and what they maybe need to be involved in and, and how they can really influence. So there might be something we can do around um, that more customer engagement in your almost technology strategy. I'm sure you've got particular customer panels or 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 sort of key um, customer involvement, as have a lot of um, housing associations um, and, in, and indeed local authorities. So I think that might be something I'd, I'd be really keen to pick that up and look whether we could facilitate something um, maybe with, you know, with peers, um, but actually include those um, those customers. Um, because uh, I've personally got a vested interest in terms of in terms of customer engagement anyway. So, um, yeah, I think that's really um, interesting. Sorry to put in. So Catherine, Sarah has from Microsoft has messaged in the chat window. Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to just say a few words on that. That looks really useful. Yeah, I think um, it's um, it's worth looking at our cloud adoption framework resources. It's a it's a really, really comprehensive framework for exactly some of the, the I guess reasons and sort of challenges that have come up on this call so whether that's actually looking at you know what what are some of your motivations or the, the business outcomes that you, you're trying to drive how can you make sure you um, align your organization so you know your end customer or your end users or your executives to some of these outcomes and actually making sure that you kind of revisit that strategy throughout any, I guess, first adoption project that you might be picking, you know, how do you go about rationalizing your digital estate, for example. So it covers, you know, quite a lot of um, of the cloud journey from sort of start to end and includes lots of technical resources as well. So whether that's migration guides, landing zone blueprints, best practices, how do you actually build a cloud center of excellence once you've got something running in Azure? You know, who needs to be part of that? What are the responsibilities? How do you kind of manage and govern that on an ongoing basis? So you're actually always able to take advantage of the, the latest innovations that might be coming out. So, you know, that's by no means everything, but definitely encourage you to, to have a look at that because there's some really useful, I guess, benchmarking tools um, that you can take advantage of. That's brilliant. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, I've just I've just opened that. So yes, we'll definitely be exploring that. Thank you. No problem. I was just, I was just going to ask quickly as well, Kishore, would you be able to share just in the chat the link to to Microsoft's training program that was released? Mm. I know just yeah. two days ago, because I've had a I've had a little look, and I think that's potentially going to be really useful for for housing and local authorities um, on that engagement side. So uh, yeah, it'd be good if you've got it to hand. I'll share it afterwards anyway. Um, Okay. Yeah, and anybody else got any further questions or comments or anything that they'd like to um, like to add before we let everybody get back to, I'm sure, an extremely uh, extremely we're on a, we're on a busy good day. time schedule today. So I'm I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like me actually. So that's quite good. Um, Is everyone happy to be invited to the the next um, webinar? So we'll be hosting one in a month's time. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Without a doubt. Yeah, great. Yeah, and and if there is any topics that that you think of um, as you uh, as you go away in your business, then then do let us know because the idea of these is they are um, they're about sort of emerging trends or, or or conversations that we're hearing. So when I when I talk to local authorities and housing associations, it's really just picking up what I hear from them and then turning that into something that might be usable for for their peers and for wider. So if there's something that's sort of a really burning um, conversation, maybe being had 
had in your authority or your housing association, j just drop us a line and, um, you know, we we'll set something up a around that because if you're thinking it, I'm sure everybody else is. Um, but yeah, so so we will we'll follow up um, and we'll let you know, as Keisha said, of lots of other um, things that are going on. Um, there's some really useful links in the um, in the chat there so you'll still have access to all of those as well um, but we'll drop you a line and if you do need any help um, just let me know on this on these slides there is um, my information so just drop me an email and Paul's information here I don't know Paul did you want to say oh yeah uh, yes, just quickly, just thanks for everyone's time as well. And um, if you if you can't see by, by my picture, um, <laughs> I'd be happy to help as well. Um, purely from from Crimson's recruitment services, this would be. But uh, but no, thank you for everyone's time. It was it was very insightful for me. Purely from a from an Azure perspective, I suppose it's um, it's advantageous for me to understand a little bit around around your current challenges, just so I can I can source the best talent, I suppose, for you. We've all seen Kira's lovely face as well. Oh, terrible. That's clearly pre-COVID before I ate far too much in lockdown. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, everyone. You're welcome. Well. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Thanks guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Bye.